time. It's a valuable thing. Welcome to Emacs at Lunch. Today we're going to look at programming with time in Elisp. We're going to look at what to expect, what to watch out for, we're going to look at some practical examples of working with time in Champagne, and then finally we're going to finish up with some goodies on using org mode to do automatic nightly commits to your agenda files. In case you don't want to check out the whole video now, be sure to check my New Year's Eve send off at the very end. There are multiple representations for times in Emacs. First we're going to look at Unix epoch time. There are three distinct ways to handle epoch time in Emacs. First is a straight list, and the members of that list are high, low, micro, pico, where micro is microseconds and pico is picoseconds. The second format is a cons, where the members are ticks and hertz. Hertz will express how precise that particular time value is. And lastly, we have the standard floating point representation for Unix time. All three of these are basically just different implementations for Unix time, and they can be used in the same situations. The only difference is that the floating point has a little bit less precision. We're going to use these times whenever we're doing something like animation or measuring some computer time where we really need the precision, or whenever we're doing arithmetic with time and we need to do comparisons. In case it looks a little bit tricky at first to pull the subsecond values off of the uh, two time lists, here are some expressions to do so. The basic pattern is that we're going to take the third element of the list, where that's going to be the microseconds, and just divide it by a million. And with the ticks hertz values, you can modulo the ticks by the hertz, and you're going to get the remainder. Just keep in mind that the precision of hertz does change. We will see some examples where that occurs. That's enough for Unix times. Let's look at calendar times. The decode time function will return this structure you see, where it's a list, and the members are seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, no, months, years. And I've just demonstrated why you want to use these functions to check out what the values are. Don't try to use the list members directly. That's probably bad form. So go for decoded time time zone, decoded time year, etc. Really quick while we're focused on the data structures, I want to mention that you can pass t as the last argument to decode time. And what it'll do is insert a ticks hertz value into the first element where the seconds are. So this gives you a time that is, it's a calendar time, but it also has precision. We're going to use calendar times to answer human scale time questions, like what day of the month is it? What week of the year is it? What day of the week is it in 90 days? Or what day of the month is the first Tuesday of next month? These are questions that are about human scale time. For a quick recap, let's pay attention to how to recognize these. Floating points or other numbers are just scalar Unix times. If you see a cons where it has the dot, then it is a ticks hertz form. If you see a list that has four members, then it's high, low, micro, pico. But this can also occur when it has lost precision. If it doesn't have subsecond precision, it'll be just high, low. And don't let that bite you because you'll be programming and you'll try to get the third value and it's not there. And now you're trying to do math with nil, it'll error out. Lastly, with calendar times, any value that has a list that's longer than four elements, you can presume that it is a calendar time. And just remember that that first element may be a ticks hertz, if that is a precise calendar time. So now let's convert these structures back and forth. The first thing I want to look at is this value called current time list. It is an option that controls the default behavior of a bunch of these functions. If you have this current time list set to t, it will return the list style time. That's the high, low, micro, pico. If you set it to nil, so we're not going to return a list, we're going to return the cons. That's the ticks hertz style. Now, setting it to nil is recommended if you want to see the newer behavior. This is where Emacs is intending to go. For the most part, how you're going to use this is instead just let binding it around the expression where you need to be sure that you're going to get one format and not another. So when you're writing packages, you want to let bind this to the value that you expect so that you're going to get the one that the rest of your code downstream is trying to work with. Time convert. This is a function that primarily translates between the numbers and the list or cons forms. It can also change the precision or do some padding, but we're mainly going to be using it to go between the list, cons, and number forms. The last argument can be used to tune the behavior so that you're going to specify one form or the other. Passing integer will round down to whole seconds. Passing list will give you the legacy list style. And passing t will give you the modern Emacs ticks hertz style. 
As for specifying precision, you probably don't need this, but you can pass a number in the final argument and it will tune the precision of the result. The only reason you would need this is if a downstream function is expecting a certain precision and it's only gonna work for the ticks hertz forms because only they express precision this way and it makes sense when you look at the argument. Converting between numbers and lists. The time convert and float time functions are basically duals of each other and other than a little bit of precision loss, they basically just reverse each other. Um, but you can use float time on any time value that time convert can return and time convert will understand every kind of float time or number. I want to mention that there are functions called time to seconds and seconds to time, but they are not in the manual. So prefer float time and time convert. Really quick, before we take a look at calendar and epoch conversion, let's remind ourselves about the relative precision of the various possible structures. Whenever you have a ticks hertz value, don't assume that the hertz is always going to be that really large integer, a trillion. Sometimes it can be one. If you take a time that doesn't have any subsecond precision and you convert it, you're going to get a one. That's one tick per second. That means that value cannot represent any higher precision. Correspondingly, if I take a low precision time and convert it to a time list, then it's only going to have the first two elements. And so, again, if you take the third element thinking that that's the microseconds, you're going to get nil. So just keep in mind what values that you or the user may pass in and what you're needing downstream in order to successfully execute. To demonstrate this loss of precision, we're going to take a look at converting calendar and epoch times. The functions for doing so are encode time and decode time. Decode time will return the calendar time. Encode time will return an epoch time. They are duals of each other. Anytime you need to convert between calendar and epoch time, you're going to want encode time or decode time. If we combine what we did earlier to demonstrate a precise calendar time with encode time, we can get a precise ticks hertz time as the output. Decode time is pretty flexible. Any one of the valid forms of epoch time will work to return a calendar time. And now let's look at timestamps. Timestamps are great because we can kind of read them, but they're a little bit annoying because they're stringly typed and sometimes they can break. If you just need a timestamp right now, use current time string. And if you want more control, then use format time string. If you need to get a time from a timestamp string, you can use parse time string. It's pretty flexible. If you check in the manual, it's got a lot of different formats that it understands. You probably don't need to tell it what format you're expecting. For time arithmetic, we have time add and time subtract. This does everything that you expect. On the comparison side, there is also nothing exciting. You get time less p and time equal p. Uh, curiously, there is no time greater p, but we don't really need it. Whenever it's time to mutate times and you're looking at epoch times, you can get away with using time add and just any number. For making updates to calendar times, just remember that there is a function called decoded time year, but there's no such thing as decoded time set year. You're going to use the set f macro in conjunction with decoded time year in order to update the year. So remember this set f macro if you're new to lisps. Whenever you do these updates, you may be thinking, can I add 5 trillion seconds to my calendar time? And the manual says, uh, please avoid it because you may run into issues with leap seconds and leap years. It most of the time works. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything about what kinds of errors to look out for. So I'm not really sure if this breaks big or breaks small, but it does seem to work. So if your application is not that sensitive, just go for it. Really quick, before we take a look at the champagne package, there is a command called list timers, and you can use list timers to view every single running timer in Emacs. There's usually only about 10. Um, that command is disabled by default, so add this to your config if you want to use this. And uh, if you're using champagne, then you'll want to to verify that your timer is running. So what is champagne? Champagne is a package that I wrote to create these mildly fancy timers. It's about as fancy as you're going to get on Emacs display. Very simple. It's on Melpa. And um, I use it to work out some things and it happens to have some timer examples in it. The first design consideration was we wanted to count down towards a goal time, but we need to start animating at goal time minus duration seconds. And to do that, we're going to start animating using this run at time function. The function that we passed in to run at time, it's only going to start the animation, so it only runs once. But 
what it does is it sets up a new timer. It does this by you create a timer, you set the time, and in this case we set it to do a repeat because we want to animate, and then we set the function. When you're setting the function, you can also set the arguments on a timer. And those arguments will be passed into the function at every single call. So you can basically treat this like a closure. If you need to attach some data to that particular instance of your timer, then you can pass it into the arguments using timer set function. And finally, timer activate to make it active. In the body, we use time subtract. Um, and I use the manual method of, of uh, using the third element of the list time in order to uh, calculate what will what was the fractional second and that's how we do the animation and then uh, when the animation is done we just call timer cancel and everything cleans up for a high level overview of how champagne does its drawing it first creates a frame this is done with the pos frame library it creates a child frame that's just a frame that has a parent set and then we use text properties and there is a space in front of the number and we change the size of that space and we change the rays uh, text property so that the text is moved up and it's pushed towards the center by that slowly growing space character. Meanwhile, we also use text properties on the numbers in order to shrink them. And because the buffer's in fundamental mode, we don't have to worry about font locking, uh, clobbering our efforts to change the text properties. The second thing that was kind of interesting was that I needed a reader. Like we needed a way to configure when will this timer go off. And at first the interface that I had on Champagne was not very good. You had to have a very specific kind of time string. And so to make that more generic, uh, the first thing I did was I noticed that, oh, the, the interface for run at time is actually, it's really close to what I want, but it had one caveat it would potentially give you a time that was in the past. And that didn't make very much sense to me. I always wanted, I, if I'm a user and I uh, say I want to do something um, and I want to schedule it, it wouldn't make much sense to schedule it where it's not going to happen. So I did a little bit of customization on top of this and I wound up with um, a set of functions where uh, there's champagne future diary time that's always going to normalize that to make it a future time and then champagne string to time to kind of do the work of trying several methods until we find one that returns a valid time. And then finally I put these behind champagne read time and that's what's used in the interactive form to actually ask the user uh, if they call this interactively, at what time do they want the timer's goal time to be? What time do they want to count down to? So check out champagne. Um, I'll, I'll show you a config at the end for how to do a New Year's Eve countdown. But next I want to take a look at using time in org and some quick functions that should get you oriented on how to work with timestamps in org mode. The three functions that I want to highlight are org read date, org timestamp to time, and org timestamp. The first one, org read date, is a pretty versatile function for reading calendar times. You can get times or just dates. Uh, you can configure it a lot of different ways. The first thing I want to highlight, though, is uh, depending on your application, you might find the calendar annoying. And there is a way to turn that off so that you can just enter in the time without, without popping up a calendar buffer. The second thing to take note of is that you can use this function to return a time value. You don't have to get a time string back and then convert it to a, and then parse it yourself. You can get a time value directly. To build up for our next example, we are going to look at uh, how using org at timestamp p. So that's a, that's a function that's going to look back and see if the point is currently at a timestamp. And if it is, then what's going to happen is that it's leaving behind match data and we can read that with match string. So wanted to point that out because it could be a little bit um, confusing at first. If we call this on the timestamp, then it's just gonna return the text of the timestamp that's at the point. If you look at the documentation for that function, it will show you how to use uh, different values from the match data so that you can potentially read one of the individual components of the timestamp directly. And now for what our actual demonstration goal was, uh, we wanted to use this org timestamp to time, but it works on org elements. And pay attention to how it works here because I'm having to call the, I'm having to get the scheduled property off the element at point. And then I pass that into org timestamp to time, and it will be able to convert this uh, into a time. 
So uh, then when I'm messaging, I'll format time stream so that we can see that the output matches what is in the timestamp. And for our final example, I wanted to demonstrate an automation I've been using for a while. And uh, this is going to commit every single one of my org agenda files uh, nightly. And the way that we do it is that we go through the org agenda files. We use VC to discover, does it have a git root? And then we take all these git roots. And by the way, I'm using the dash library. So all these functions that begin with dash, these are uh, uh, functions that work on lists. And this distinct call here reduces all of the uh, all of the git roots into just the ones that are unique. And then on those roots, I'm going to go in and call two shell commands. I'm going to add everything that's in the in the directory, and then I'm going to write a commit, and it's formatted using the current time. And then to run this, we're going to call run at time. And we're going to call it with 24, with no AM or PM. That'll, that'll run every single day at midnight. Before we set up Champagne to do a New Year's Eve countdown, please check out my GitHub sponsors and buy me a coffee. Or because it's New Year's Eve, please buy me a beer. The link's below, and for a dollar a month, you can see what's in the pipe. And to be sure that you have a great New Year's Eve countdown, just use this hunk to install the Champagne package, and it'll set up a 60-second timer that will count down until midnight and then run the list timers function to verify that you can see that the timer is set. Happy New Year's Eve and time for me to go party.